like folks are filtering in. All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to this session. Um, before we get started, though, I do have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstance creates a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. The presenter may now begin and I'll paste the full code of conduct in the chat if anyone needs it. Thank you, Andrew, you can take it away. Great, thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here today. Uh, and I'm happy to be talking about uh, tenure and promotion, although you know sometimes people aren't so happy to be talking about it, um, at least until they have it. So uh, my name is Andrew McKinney. I am the OER coordinator at the City University of New York. Normally, I do these presentations with my colleague Amanda Coolidge from BC campus, uh, but she was not able to make it today. Uh, but the title of our presentation is uh, Valuing OER and Tenure Promotion, the Doer's Three OER Contribution Matrix. There's a lot of terms in there that you might not know, uh, but well, trust, trust me, we'll get to explaining what everything we're talking about here is. Um, so this is, a, I'm going to use Menti, uh, Mentimeter today. So um, you can follow along because uh, I'm going to ask some questions, do some polling questions. Um, so if you want to follow along and access the slides and do the interactive questions, you go to menti.com and then you input 7936-3284. If someone could put that in the chat for me, that would be fantastic. Um, gotcha. And we could, uh, and we're going to use that code, and we're going to have just some, uh, I'll have some demographic questions, just about who's in the room, and and then some questions about, you know, what your feelings are about both the what I'm about to share you, but also generally, sort of, if you've gone through tenure promotion, have you used OER, that sort of thing. Okay, so we 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 have that in the chat. Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Sean. All right, so moving along. So I am here today representing uh, the Doers 3 Collaborative. Uh, Doers stands for Driving OER uh, for Sustainable Student Success. So Doers 3 uh, cubed, I suppose. Um, and we have a website, it's doers3.org. You can go and check it out. Uh, it has our statement of purpose. It has uh, the, some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, essentially what Doers is, is it's a collaborative of folks like myself who are, uh, in charge of large OER programs. Now, to be clear, I, what my job is, is to sort of coordinate all of our uh, 24 campuses at CUNY uh, to do uh, OER work. I don't, I'm not in the trenches like a lot of folks who I'm sure are here. I used to be, but now I'm sort of more at an administrator level. So most of the folks at Doers are, are administrators like myself who are in charge of overseeing these sort of large, either statewide or system-wide um, uh, OER programs. Uh, so we serve over 6 million students at 688 colleges. Uh, you can see from our map, these are sort of the represented systems. Um, we've got some folks in the South. Our friend uh, Jeff Gallant from Affordable Georgia uh, is, is in the group. Uh, got a lot of folks in Texas. Um, so, uh, you know, I represent CUNY. We have some folks at SUNY. We also have Amanda's at BC campus in, in, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, and we've uh, until very recently had some folks representing us from uh, eCampus Ontario, though, she will pick that up again. So the way we do our work in Doers, it's all volunteer, um, but we have our, sort of, our works are separated out into three, what we call work groups. Uh, there's a working group around equity, um, which you'll be seeing some stuff about as it's, there's an equity rubric that we're about to release. Uh, there's a, a group uh, focused around research uh, that's still sort of working on, you know, producing some, uh, uh, common rubrics, uh, common variables for research. Uh, and my the group that I lead is called Building Capacity. And so uh, the Building Capacity work group's charge is essentially to approach uh, a number of what we see as, as like persistent obstacles uh, to sustaining uh, OER programs, right? And so uh, the project that I'm going to talk about today is about tenure promotion, which we've found is like a pretty persistent problem. And we have another one, if you go to the doers3.org, you can see it. Uh, and that um, We've, all, we've just released that's about uh, listing fulfillment in bookstores, which we've, uh, a lot of folks had expressed that there was, you know, that's a problem trying to get OER listed, uh, either just as like, you know, you're, you're doing your course listings uh, to be in compliant of federal law, 
um, or just getting it in the bookstore to make sure students know that there's a free option and, and whatnot. So this particular project around tenure promotion has been mostly a collaboration between myself, Amanda, and uh, Deep Shinoy. Some of you might know Deep. Uh, he is a consultant who works in the OER space. Uh, he's a great guy and has a, has a lot of knowledge to bring to the, to the fore. So I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Now, this, this has data already from uh, all the other times that we've done this. So, but if you could... Uh, uh, take this question if you're following along at Mentimeter. Again, the uh, the code is, uh, I can go back to the chat, as uh, menti.com code 79363284. Uh, so we just want to get a sense of, of who's there. You can see like most of who we've been talking to have been librarians, um, which at CUNY, librarians do our, our faculty and go up for tenure. Uh, and so some of this I think is, is useful for them. If you're not faculty, uh, it's, it's useful if you're doing faculty development, right? And this is something you can think through with your with your faculty there. Um, so I'll just leave this up for a little bit more time. I mean, I th I think what we're that everything in tenure promotion here, even if you're staffing, you're not like myself, and you uh, don't you're not on a tenure track. A lot of the folks that we're dealing with, right, are faculty, and they are on the tenure track, and therefore it's important to to be able to communicate this stuff and uh, what i'm going to show you I, I hope will be an important tool for you either for recruitment for folks into your your programs or uh um for folks who have already gone through it who who maybe need uh some help sort of uh figuring out how to talk about what they're doing um not getting a ton of responses so i'll just go ahead and move along i do i would also like to say that i think it's interesting that a lot of at a lot of our uh, conferences, right, for open education, we do still have a very high librarian uh, uh, sort of uh, quotient um, amongst the folks who are at these things. So I think that's great. I mean, the libraries have pushed it. I work for the Office of Library Services, but I am not by trade a librarian. Uh, so I think it's an interesting element of, of the field still as such, right? So moving on. Um, so when we were putting together sort of our initial projects in Dewards uh, for the building capacity work group, uh, we realized that, you know, this was partially selfish for me. You know, I'm running a large program. I know that faculty are not, uh, are struggling around how to fit this work into their tenure promotion. It's also a recruitment tool. So, and we know, you know, if you're on the listservs, you know, any of the big ones like CCC OER or Lib OER or whatever, you'll see, you know, probably three, four times a year, sometimes more, somebody asking, is there some place that has a model policy or some place that does OER and uh, does OER in tenure like explicitly? Uh, or are, are there people that you know who've done it and could I talk to them? Right. And so we know that this is a persistent problem. So when we started our project, we thought a lot about how a TMP process uh, and what it looks like, right? And so Amanda got us access to uh, a, uh, a set of documents from uh, a, a SCALCOM um, group at Simon Fraser University who was doing a big research project about uh, uh, promotion and tenure documents and, and guidelines, uh, particularly around including open access uh, scholarship in that. Uh, at mostly at R1s and a, a little bit of R2s, right? So I looked at a lot of those documents. There's a lot of them. I couldn't look through all of them. And, and you know, what I saw was something I think we most of us would know uh, is that TMP processes very widely, right? And and what, what counts as research or teaching or service or any number of other categories varies widely, widely depending on the type of school, you know, what counts or what's emphasized at the community colleges is going to be different than what's emphasized at an R1 uh, or at a small liberal arts college, right? Um, but even then, between departments, things change. That's what count, what counts or what's emphasized in a bench science, like in biology or chemistry or or even in engineering, is going to be different than what counts in an English department, right? So we didn't really understand. We had to take a step back and say, so what? How can we intervene? How can we think about this in a way that that will will help the most people? Uh, you know, we thought about drafting a model policy, uh, but we were a little sort of, there aren't very many out there. So that felt like, you know, trying to sort of do something out of whole cloth. We thought about doing something like a model, like dear colleague letter. Um, that's something that like a dean or a provost or a president could send out to their community that would say, we want you to consider OER and tenure and promotion. Uh, but we, we were a little leery about doing a sort of like top down approach. 
so, you know, one of the things that I think it's important to, to understand, at least uh, for a lot of institutions that have to, uh, that have large unions or union representation, is sometimes when an administration says something, especially about something as as, as uh, sensitive as tenure and promotion, sometimes the faculty have a tendency to either shut it out or be against it. And so we didn't really want to come as a group of administrators and say, "Here's this top-down thing," and and see it kind of get bandied around. So. We, came, we, we thought that maybe we, we should think through a more sort of bottom-up approach. But before we did that, we tried to think about, come back to sort of the original sort of, what is tenure for, right? So we looked back at the 1940 uh, Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure that the AAUP, uh, the American Association of University Professors, put out in the 1940s. It's a very specific time in the history of universities, uh, you know, and, you know, we're kind of moving into by in five to 10 years from then, we're into the post-war era, we're into a boom in public, particularly in public universities. Uh, so they're, they're really sort of thinking forward as to sort of what's gonna happen. So the overall purpose of tenure in that statement is to ensure one, academic freedom, right? So folks can uh, have tenure and then no longer worry about, you know, what, what kind of work they're doing. Uh, and whether or not it's being it's, it, it is approved by the public or by the administration, they have tenure, they have a, a job security, right? Uh, so we can push uh, and broaden the types of research available, um, but it's also to provide enough economic security to make the profession attractive, right? So we're also talking about if we're looking at you know the 40s and the 50s; these are economic boom times, obviously for a, a small set of uh, of identities. Um, but we're looking to make the profession attractive in the face of that boom. Right, so we're trying to draw good talent and give them economic security in the face of you know a booming economy. So the other the thing that Amanda and I talked a lot about when we were sort of initially working on this was you know so much of OER work is what she she calls off the desk work. Right, it's stuff that you know isn't necessarily in your contract, isn't necessarily in your like what people consider your day to day work. And so what we were trying to do is sort of fit this, figure out some way to fit this back into kind of an academic freedom and economic security model that offers folks incentive to do this kind of work, right? In the same way that academic freedom is, offers the incentive to do bold work, we wanna offer the incentive to do the bold work of open education, right? So um, I just wanna, before we get into anything, have, have you, if you've gone through tenure, the tenure promotion process. Have you added your OER contribution to your TMP dossier? So I'll give you a little bit of time to answer this. Nice to see some yeses. Um, I think definitely we're gonna at a certain point reach, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit in next steps. Ooh, ooh, oh, we almost almost got to a yes majority there for a second. That that was great. I enjoyed that. Um, sorry if anybody can hear my my toddler in the background voicing his opinion. Um, so, uh, okay, I like to see the return still coming in. Um, so this is interesting to us. I, I don't think when we initially started doing this uh, and presenting on this that we would would thought we would have seen so many yeses, especially to no's, right? Like the NA, you know, if we got administrators or uh, librarians who were staff or other staff members, instructional designers, what who are not in here who are not on the track, you know, that makes sense that NA would be large, but. Uh, it's a, a little surprising to me that we saw so many people. I would love to hear in the Q and A uh, some some folks, you know, what that how that worked out for you and how you did it, especially in relation to what we're we're about to talk about. So I'm going to move on. Uh, so the OER contributions matrix is our first attempt to approach this problem of tenure and promotion in OER. We it's essentially, and I'll show show it to you in a second, uh, a document that is intended to give faculty both the sort of a framework, and again, everything we're going to do gets OER, right? It's it's openly licensed. It's all open to adaptation. Um, but so in in its initial stab, it's really just meant to give faculty or staff who are guiding these faculty just a framework to think about how to include OER in your in your tenure promotion documents. And we want we sort of think this as a sort of uh, policy from below. You know, if enough people are adapting it, then maybe we can start to really uh, produce. Um, uh, a, a cohort of folks uh, who can argue for it and we'll see it and it either becomes natural, maybe not written into policy or it becomes policy uh, uh, just by nature of practice. So 
uh, this is a, a, a little screenshot of it, but I'm going to actually go to another browser um, and or browser window and just show you uh, what the full matrix looks like. Um, so what we've done is we've sort of set up this structure where we have uh, our types of OER uh, work. We have adopt, adapt, create, like our classic sort of forms of OER work. And then some more sort of squishy ones that are around improved learning, building community, uh, contributing to research. And then uh, we have, you know, in this left-hand column, we have the type of uh, contribution. On the, all the way to the right, we, we are making an argument for whether or not it fits in our three uh, classic three categories in a TMP dossier, which is research, teaching, and service, right? Other places have different ones, but I found in that sort of random walk through the RPT documents that um, it was really about, it was really gonna break down to t research, teaching, and service. And then this middle column, which I think is particularly the most ripe for adaptation, uh, is some ideas we have for how you would prove what you've done, right? So that's an evidence column. So, you know, let's say uh, you created, uh, you've made a new OER. So for that, you know, when creating an OER, uh, make it available to peers for review, document the, the rules review and include it in your dossier. So you could use the common rubric that the OTN uh, network, uh, the OTN folks use. Uh, there's also some guidelines for peer review that the Rebus network has used. I mean, so we would also say that, you know, making new OER could count for research and teaching. Now, obviously, if you're making a textbook, we were having this conversation before we started the webinar, textbooks are often sort of looked down upon and don't count as research. Uh, but, you know, we're all for making new arguments. So uh, maybe you can push that argument. Uh, maybe you've done some research around your OER, uh, you know, with your students. Um, maybe it includes student research. So there's a, a number of ways you can make that argument. But again, that's maybe more for the evidence column. But if we keep going through that, it makes it a little unwieldy. I want to sort of push along real quick so we can get uh, through to the Q&A. Um, so my question here is, how would this matrix look different at your campus? So just as an example for mine, for my campus or campuses, so we get uh, a bunch of money uh, from the state every year, a bunch of money. We get $4 million uh, per, per year from the state to fund OER at our 24 campuses. Uh, and so we have a very, uh, like an RFP process that we do with the campuses. And then we ask any sort of OER that's produced out of a converted course uh, um, that goes into our, uh, our repository. So one of our evidences is putting a, like, a, particularly for adaptation, for, uh, or for, for uh, adoption is create a new syllabus, put that syllabus in CUNY Academic Works, which is our repository. Um, so right, uh, some things about retention. I'm not sure if we're seeing um, new things at all in here. Um, I know a lot of folks have talked about shared governance and I know that's absolutely true. Um, you know, one of the things I think that I've seen in a lot of different schools is that that system works wildly differently. Uh, who's got control, like at, at system levels, oftentimes it's really down to the, the campuses and that does include a shared governance thing. And I hope for your sake, it includes a shared governance thing. Um, so let's move along real quick. Uh, so the other thing is who would you need to involve in the adaptation of this matrix, right? Um, right now, I am sort of rolling out my adaptation very slowly. So right now I'm meeting with a sort of select group of the folks who are coordinating on each campus and we're including some faculty uh, to, to how to adapt because we're trying to do this again, a little bottom, bottom uppy. But I think if, you're, if you have a place where you feel like you have good buy-in, right? Around OER from say your faculty senate or your union or your deans, then I think including them also works. You know, one of the things uh, we had a conversation with some folks in the Midwest a couple of uh, months ago, and one of the things we talked about was a sandwich, uh, bottom up and top down, right? So let's let's try and keep that uh, as um, multi pronged, a diversity of tactics, as I like to say. So uh, just to wrap up, so we can get into have a little bit of time for Q and A. Um, so we're still working on this. We're working on an FAQ sheet that will be you know, uh, for folks who are, who are trying to disseminate it, um, you know, 
some basic questions and some some other stuff like that. We we're, we want to collect. We're trying to collect case studies. So if you have used uh, OER in your TMP and that was successful, or even even if it wasn't successful, uh, or was ignored or what have you, we would love to hear about it. I'll have my email address here at the end, um, and we're going to continue to distribute this and 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 push it out as much as possible. Uh, uh, Man and I wrote a, a blog post for uh, the New England Board of Higher Education's um, uh, blog, this Practitioner's Corner, um, and we're about to hopefully have a uh, an op-ed placed in Inside Higher Education. Uh, so we're trying to push the message uh, as much as possible and make it available to everyone. So I just want to thank everybody for your time, uh, for your responses. If you had enough time, the Mentimeter is still up there if you want to go back and, and work through stuff. Um, so you can free to follow up with me if you've got a case study you want to share, if you want to uh, work through this uh, at all. I'm available. I'm very passionate about this. I really want this to work for everybody. My email is just andrew.mckinney at cuny.edu. Um, if you know Amanda already and you want to reach out to her, you can reach out to her as well. It's acoolidge at bccampus.ca. So I will stop there. I'm going to uh, leave that up. Um, but I will take a look at the Q and A, and we can. Uh, Thank you, Andrew, so much for for a great presentation. Um, and as Katie noted, kid knows kid noises are always welcome. Um, <laughs> as a father of a toddler myself, it's yeah. oddly comforting to hear <laughs> someone else dealing with screaming in the background. Yeah, uh, it's a solidarity moment. Definitely. It really is. Yeah, it, yeah. It's really I'm like, oh, that sounds familiar. I just muted myself somehow, uh, <laughs> but feel free to put those in the Q&A or in chat and uh, we'll answer those. Uh, so Rosa writes, uh, the department has a ca my department has a category for improved pedagogy under the teaching criteria. I described my OER adoption and development efforts there. That's great. I don't know how um, common that is. I wish that it was more common, um, but I do think that's where a lot of this Obviously, a lot of our OER work is going to fall under teaching. And I think, you know, what I like to th think about is I think that really is going to depend on your um, uh, on your campus and on your department as to how well teaching is valued as opposed to research, right? Um, I, you know, it's a it's a bit of a, a conundrum, I think, in a lot of places where I think I have a, a very particular opinion that I, I won't get too deep into about uh, how I, that I think there's been a slippage um, in the last 10 to 15 years to sort of push research harder at uh, schools that aren't, aren't R1s as sort of categories for tenure. And I think, I, I think that's kind of damaging to a lot of schools. Um, and I, I, I prefer to think, you know, a lot of what our, our role is, 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 is teaching. I'm a former, I used to be a faculty member uh, before I started work doing more administrative to, uh, tasks. So um, that was always my great love. That was what I was there for. I know that's not the case for a lot of faculty, uh, but I do think it's it's a shame if we're not valuing OER work as improving learning, right? Improving student success and that having that lost out to, you know, getting as many journal articles or your monograph published as quick as possible in that first seven years, right? So. Uh, any other thoughts, questions? A little surprised that we don't have more. Uh, evidently, I've honed this presentation so well that I've answered everyone's question. That's an old teaching joke I used to make all the time. <laughs> well, so like I said, um, feel free to reach out to us. Do go to doers3.org. Uh, uh, and take a look at all of our projects. Um, the OER Equity Blueprint is up there, uh, I think in a small form. I think the rubric is up. I don't know that the full blueprint is up. Um, and this is a very important, uh, very important work that's being done. The Listing and Fulfillment um, report is up there. It's just basically like some suggestions for best practices for, for faculty, you know, you know, make sure when you create, get an ISBN. Uh, um, you know, uh, you know, for for vendors, for administrators, that sort of thing, and then the tenure promotion matrix is there. I really do encourage everybody to take a look at this. I think it's going to be helpful. 
we've gotten a lot of really good feedback. We before we released it, we we took in a lot of feedback from folks. Um, and if you do adopt it, please reach out to me uh, or or to Amanda. We really want to see what people's adaptations look like. Um, again, it's a, it's an OER. It's CC BY. Do whatever you want to it. Uh, so we really want to see those. We really want to understand how people are are, are using it. Um, yeah, uh, just to Lisa's point, I, I mean, I think this is really, this is really the point, right? Like this is, we want to start this conversation and we want to know how people are doing it. So when folks do do it, what we want is, we, we want to take that as a case study, right? So we can show to other folks, how, how did you start that conversation? How did it go? Who did you talk to? What was your, what was your deal? I think, you know, this makes me think a little bit, Lisa, that maybe we should look at making like a little bit of a template for those case studies, right? That includes a, you know, who did you include? Uh, uh, how did that conversation go? Where's, what departments are, are interested? That sort of thing, right? So I think, I, I think it would give people a little bit of uh, a framework, right? Because that's all we're trying to do here is just give people the framework to talk about this. It's a new field, it's new work. A lot of people don't know about it. And, and so, you know, it's hard to take a new thing and put it into the crusty old, sort of structure of tenure and promotion. And so we just want to give people that opportunity, right? And then we want to, you know, sing its praises and and uh, um, and sing it to the mountains or whatever my terrible phrase was there. Uh, okay, um, I think that's our time. I don't want to uh, run into the next session. Uh, so again, I just want to thank everybody uh, and please reach out. It's andrew.mckinney, M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y at uh, cuny.edu. Uh, and that's... then real quick, Andrew, just because uh, yeah. the chat's, I think, defaulting to panelists or to uh, attendees uh, only. Looks like Jeff saying they're going to try and adapt um, the models of recommendation. And uh, Lisa said she really likes the idea of providing case studies. <laughs> great. great. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Take care, y'all. We'll see you at the next session. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sean. I will close us out. Sounds good.